Salah Abu Ghassim is Deputy Director of Partner Development with Islamic Relief. He joins us from Libya. The charity has launched an emergency response and is working with local partners to provide relief. Salah, thanks so much for your time. Tell us how you're working with local partners, what the challenges you've faced and what people need most right now. Well, this is a very unprecedented uh, humanitarian crisis. Um, it, it's, it's so unprecedented in the sense that it took a while for the outside world, including agencies like ourselves, to get a true understanding of the picture. And this was because of the type of crisis and, and, and challenge with the water, with the flooding. Telecoms within Darna was completely cut out. Um, the flooding took place in the early hours. The rain, heavy rain, was about this time last week. Then the dam broke early hours of Monday morning. It wasn't until Monday evening. People were aware of the flooding. People were aware there was a problem. But it wasn't until, until Monday evening uh, the picture started to break. At that time, the anticipation was a few hundred lives had been lost. As the minutes, the, the, the hours, the days went on, the situation became worse and worse. And only then we got a true picture. We've been working around the clock. We've got a lot of experience uh, and know-how in working in the Libyan uh, country. Um, I am of Libyan heritage myself, and many of the other team members are on the ground working around the clock doing as much as we can. It's been so challenging. It's been very heavily documented, and, it, and, and it's well known, the fact that politically there are many challenges. We also have to appreciate this is a, a state that's a fragile state. It's a broken state, mm. an absence of institutions. Um, many things that you'd usually rely on in order to have some form of coordination haven't been there. But I must say now in the last few days, things have improved. We've been working as hard as we can. Mm -hmm. uh, we ourselves are working with local partners, using our own staff and others also on the ground in order to understand the needs and then respond. And so far, we've been able to reach a good few thousand people. The needs are many. The needs are varied. Yep. We're doing as much as we can. And as your report highlighted, we, we need to all continue to support yep. the efforts. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about the political situation in just a moment. But as far as what your uh, aid groups are doing on the ground, from what I hear, there is a growing risk of the spread of diseases from the sort of stagnant floodwater that could compound the already very strained humanitarian crisis. What kind of diseases are we talking about and how do they spread in this kind of situation? So it's waterborne diseases, um, cholera and, and others. Um, and what we're talking about is the fact that the water itself um, from the dam has broken. Um, the rain flood uh, and rainwater has, has gone all over the streets. The water, and, and, and as the flooding has come, it's swept absolutely everything with it. Um, and we're talking about, forgive me for saying it and being so graphic, but many dead bodies being uh, in that water for a long, long time, uh, many dead carcasses uh, of animals, um, all sorts of things. And, and the water, there isn't a water supply, and, and people naturally want to wash their hands, people want to drink water, people want to, um, you know, use water as, as they normally would. Uh, and the challenge and concern and risk is that there are areas of, of, of the water stream that have been affected and people may not necessarily know this and may be using it because it's natural for us all to, to, to have a need for the access of water. Mm. Um, but the whole water system has, has, has been infected. And as time goes on, as there are more and more bodies, as there are more and more people, um, as there are more items within, you know, the, the, the whole situation because of the fact that the flood water took absolutely yeah. everything with it. Um, then naturally, of course, th there will be a major problem. One of the things that has, has started to happen on Friday, there was there was a call for mass um, uh, evacuation from the area in order to limit the spread of disease and limit to, to, to manage this. Our message is really simple. Um, what's happened has happened. It's a huge humanitarian crisis. Let us respond to that. Let us also understand that we have to be in preventative Mm. measures now to put that in our mind in order to ensure the absence of a second humanitarian crisis, not only the waterborne diseases, the spread of disease, but also added to that the absence of hunger, shelter, um, people feeling and, and having a real, you know, yeah. uh, unbelievable trauma that they've faced because of everything that they've been through. Um, this is a long-term challenge that's going to require long-term solutions, and we have to be committed in the long term to support them. So talk to me a little bit about how that looks, especially given the fragile political situation in Libya at the moment, uh, two fractions of government. How has that worked in terms of organisations trying to get access to the country, investing aid, and knowing what the long-term recovery efforts look like? Is there concern about corruption, how that aid or funds will be used? And also, apologies for the longer question, we don't have a lot of time. Do you see a discrepancy in the way in which international aid bodies like yourselves 
or countries respond to various countries. For example, Morocco, the earthquake, had widespread international interest and response. But has Libya seen the same thing? Is there a discrepancy there? No, no, I mean, I've been working in the humanitarian space for 16 years. No two disasters will ever be the same, whatever they may be. Um, it's been a, an unbelievable week in the sense that last a, a week, Friday ago, the, the earthquake took place in Morocco. Our teams were deployed Saturday morning. The crisis took place in, in Libya early hours of Monday. Our, deplete, our teams were deployed Monday evening. So we're responding. We're doing our best. Every country's context is very different. As I mentioned, and I've said throughout this, is, is very unprecedented in the fact that there are two, um, you know, governing authorities, one recognized, one unrecognized. We also need to understand there are a lot of militia groups. So this poses a lot of risk. But organizations like ourselves, we have processes. We work in all kinds of, of, of situations, in war-torn countries, in, in risky situations. It's our duty and responsibility to be at the front line to assist and help people through humanitarian crises, whatever they may be, whatever is needed. But we also have to put due diligence in place. We have to ensure that measures are put in place to avoid and ensure that aid is not used as a politicized tool, to ensure it reaches those who are most in need. With our experience of 40 odd years, this is what we do. It's challenging. It may at times take longer, but ensuring that things are done in the right way is our duty and responsibility. All right, Saleh, I really appreciate your time. Saleh Abu Ghassam, Deputy Director of Partner Development with Islamic Relief.